Well, hi, Lee. How are you? Hi, Namali. I'm fine. How are you? Good. Good to see you today. And we are back to doing a recording after a really long time. And it's really interesting to think that we started doing um, recordings about um, sort of basic introductions to Ken Wilber's integral theory. We started doing this around the spring of 2020 when the pandemic was just starting and lo and behold, we are still inside of the pandemic. And um, we took a break, we were doing a bunch of other things, but um, one of the last videos we did was on um, shadow, which is one of the four modules, one of the four key modules of what is referred to as an integral life practice. In order to have an integral life practice, we are encouraged to have a spiritual module, a spiritual practice, an intellectual or a mind uh, uh, practice, and a shadow practice. And we have two videos that are posted on practicalintegral.com on shadow. The fourth of the key modules is the body module. Certainly, there may be many uh, important things to talk about why the body is important and why an integral life practice considers the body such an important part of our daily practice. So I'd love for you to kick us off, Lee, if you have some interesting material that you can share with us. Well, certainly. So thanks for the introduction and the, and the setting of the scene, Namali. So if we're speaking about the body, then one of the ways to to consider the importance of the body is to consider what happens when we experience poor physical health for instance so just think of a time when you perhaps injured yourself sprained a, a joint or something like that and to notice how different your experience of reality becomes when you have to deal with uh, with an injury, and that, and that can be a fairly minor injury, and uh, perhaps you've even experienced larger injuries or, uh, or diseases or disorders where your entire life is basically becomes focused around the um, dealing with the physical impairments. So in thinking about it in that way, if it's really important to have a physical body that functions as well as possible, then we can identify a number of factors that you can focus on and pay attention to and invest energy and time in to make sure that your physical body um, works as effectively as possible. And Amali, you and I were speaking about this a couple of weeks ago, and, and you shared with me that you use a, um, a five-prong approach whenever you're speaking, uh, whenever you're coaching someone within an integral life uh, practice context, and that you uh, you identified those five elements. So could you share those with, uh, with the viewers, please? And, uh, and we can then move on from uh, and explore each of those uh, facets. So the five pillars of health are good hydration every day, um, sleep, good sleep hygiene, nutrition, exercise, and rest. Well, thanks, Namali. So great. I think it's a good idea perhaps to sketch for each of those five pillars, a little bit of context for people to be able to navigate those uh, pillars effectively. So if we start, for instance, with sleep, then we can say that most advice from regulatory organizations and from uh, sleep institutes and um, institutions like that um, typically advise adults to sleep between seven and nine hours per uh, day or per night. The reason that sleep is so important, or one of the reasons is that if we sleep much shorter, for instance, um, research has been done on adults who uh, sleep only four hours, or at least they were kept awake for the rest of the time and they were allowed only to sleep four hours, is what you then see in the, um, uh, if you take blood from those uh, subjects, is that you see that they are, after a few nights of sleeping only four hours a night, 
you can see the beginning of uh, diabetic um, onset. So a lack of sleep over a prolonged period of time can actually induce uh, uh, diabetes um, uh, complaints. And also um, another benefit of sleeping is of course that cell regeneration occurs. Um, uh, so repair tasks within, the, within our body uh, but also memory consolidation processes. So things that we've learned throughout the day are uh, consolidated from short-term into long-term memories. And also um, people who sleep very few hours per night, they tend to have a higher risk of becoming obese because the uh, appetite suppressing hormone um, is then not produced in sufficient quantities throughout the, uh, throughout the night and the day. So those are just a few reasons why uh, getting a, a good night's sleep uh, is, is very important. Mm -hmm. And it's also useful to be aware that if you're a teenager, then you need far more sleep than uh, you do as an adult. And if you're an elderly adult, then you typically need uh, a few hours of sleep. So it's also relative to where you are. And very young infants, for instance, can sleep up to 16 hours uh, a day. So Nice. Indeed. <laughs> I, I don't know why I just suddenly have this like need to like sleep for 16 hours. That would be so yeah. nice. <laughs> I think it's uh, one of the uh, attractions of sleeping 16 hours is that there's no responsibilities as an infant and there's nothing, uh, no taxes need to be paid and things like that. Right, exactly. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Um, what about nutrition? Yes, so nutrition is a, is a very extensive subject, of course, and many uh, expert opinions exist which differ from each other. Uh, but in general, we can say that there are macronutrients, which are fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, and micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals and other trace elements. And that our body consists of a variety of, um, of building blocks, so to speak, and other processes uh, or other chemicals that we need to, um, to make sure that our body functions well. And basically nutrition is making sure that we consume foods that support our physical well-being and the perpetuation of our physical body over time. Yeah, that's beautiful. Also, I think since we're speaking about integral or the context of our conversation is also integral life practice. I also really like how this is something that is in the, um, again, it's the integral life practice book. Um, on page 167, there's a great little um, chart that they created where on the upper left, they encourage us to a uh, sort of an integral nutrition plan would mean that we eat mindfully, um, that we actually practice um, eating and feeding our bodies mindfully. And that's an upper left practice. On the upper right, to eat optimal foods, foods that are good for you, and to really kind of practice how we can choose not to feed our bodies with food that really just doesn't serve us anymore. And then on the lower right is to eat sustainably which I really like also. And then on the lower left, it says eat meaningfully. And I was actually really interested in what they meant by eat, eat meaningfully. So just to read a little bit from the book, the we of nutrition includes the shared meanings surrounding food. Culture influences your food choices. A culture's history and preferences favor certain kinds of food over others raises certain health concerns and ignores others and attaches group identities to people based on their nutritional patterns. For example, a traditional meat and potato kind of guy as American as, American as apple pie um, or a granola hippie. Um, practicing integral nutrition includes being aware of how different cultures collectively interpret and relate to food. So I thought that's really interesting as well. Nice. I yeah. also, when I'm eating, I would frequently become aware of all of the people who've been involved in the production of, of what I'm eating in the growing and, and the uh, harvesting and the shipping and the packaging. And it's just, we're so embedded, all of us in, in a global 
system of food production and it's really um it, in me it, it sort of elicits a, a deep feeling of, of gratitude to be able to have access to to food and um on a, on a daily basis and to be able to sustain um, my physical body with with these nutrients yeah. yeah and i and i think this sort of eating meaningfully where sort of we are taking culture into account um, brings me to mind um, our beloved anthony bourdain who i used to love so much anthony bourdain was a food expert who had a cnn show you know, when he took his own life in France, it was a really, really huge um, news item at the time. And there was a lot of sadness because I think what people realized was that through food, he would introduce people to culture, to different cultures. He would travel the entire globe and, and eat with people and sort of eat meaningfully with other cultures. So even just in a kind of a really simple practice, I think we can check ourselves how all, there's so much that we can learn about a culture by opening our uh, minds and opening our taste buds to different food from different cultures. So I just, I just somehow really, that, that stuck with me from, from this book somehow about nutrition. Oh, yeah. That's nice. Nice. So how about exercise? Yes. Well, that's another very extensive subject. And uh, well, as you know, of course, I uh, became a physical therapist when I was uh, uh, 22, and I've, I've seen many uh, patients and, and helped many people realize exercise goals. And, and I think one of the things we can say is that having a regular exercise practice or having a regular, let's call it a regular movement practice to make it as accessible for, for everyone as possible, is it's so important because the physical body that we inhabit, it it's, it's evolved to continue to be in motion. So all of our joints are made to, to move and, um, and our, our whole uh, cardiovascular system is made to be adapted to um, both rest and exertion. So to have a regular exercise or movement practice is, is quite important, important. And it's also important to make it something that you feel motivated doing. Because many people, of course, struggle to maintain a, a regular movement or exercise practice because it requires something and it's not always pleasant. So you're basically doing something that sometimes feels um, uncomfortable or feels um, like you could be doing better things uh, during the same time. But what you're basically doing by exercising is you're investing in your health little by little so you're, you're putting money in in your physical bank so to speak mm -hmm. yeah that's a lovely metaphor i like that i wish i did more of this this is where integral is such a helpful tool because when we speak about the body module we're really speaking about the upper right and it's so interesting to see with each of these five pillars that we're speaking about um, how the other quadrants are deeply involved. So I think having the integral map is really useful because for me, when I challenge to have a physical exercise practice that is ongoing and that I'm capable of sort of sustaining it, I often have to look at my upper left, like what's the motivation or the lack thereof that gets me into trouble in trying to maintain a physical practice. So yeah, I think that's, that's precise. I think what we're talking about is precisely why integral theory, integral philosophy, um, Ken Wilbur and lots of other teachers that we, that we have paid attention to uh, really promoting a sense of integral life practice and even a physical practice that involves the other quadrants. In fact, one could also say there are some among us who are so dedicated to the upper right physical module um, and exercising, but maybe really broken in their relationships or maybe really um, struggling in their kind of self-awareness about other things in their lives. So any of these things could also become addictive, which is also sort of a, an interesting thing that happens if we're not paying attention to all four quadrants and how we, ex how we explore this. 
But yeah, the exercise is, I would even go so far as to say that exercise is one of the hardest things for some people to do. When even I know that it's so good for me, but I put it at the, like the bottom of the pile sometimes. Some of us really struggle in this domain. So to continue to kind of work on it and to, to, to educate ourselves on it. Um, Michelle Obama, who, um, who I really admire, her entire uh, sort of the main body of work that she undertook as the uh, former first lady of the US was around physical exercise and good nutrition because as a country, there is so much struggle around that in this country. This is the most, um, I'm in the US, you're in Amsterdam, but in the US, this is the most medicated society in the world. So to get people to move, to get people to eat well, if it was easy, we would be doing this regularly. And this is a really hard part, I think, for, uh, for large numbers of populations. And there's a lot of culture involved in that as well. I mean, coming from Sri Lanka, I can say also, Sri Lankans are not necessarily known for deep health in their bodies, I think. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to sort of add that piece to that. What about, um, what have we not yet talked about? We talked about sleep, we talked about nutrition, we talked about exercise. So maybe briefly around uh, rest and hydration. Indeed. Well, let's, um, t let's start with hydration because especially, um, it's interesting to me that um, some athletes what they do to manage their hydration um, to, to keep it optimal. So hydration is basically making sure that your body is, is uh, um, contains enough fluids. So typically we do this by ingesting uh, water or other fluids. So some athletes, when they're, um, when they're going to perform uh, in a sports match or something like that, they weigh themselves in advance, then they participate in the sports match, then they weigh themselves afterwards to see how much fluids they lost through sweating, through breathing, and through um, uh, their basic exertion. And then they know how much to replenish. So that's one, one of the ways we can think about also hydration is that we're continually, just even when we're sleeping, when we're breathing, we're losing fluids from our body. So we have to replenish these. And again, just like with nutrition, if we think of the body as being uh, composed of building blocks, then water is just another another one of those building blocks. And we need water, of course, for our blood. We need it for our um, all of our the surfaces, for instance, surfaces of, of our eyes, the um, mucus lining in our noses, and things like that. We need to ingest enough water, but we also need to be careful not to ingest too much water. So um, some people um, will drink so much water that they can actually um, damage their kidneys. And there have been people who, for instance, uh, uh, under the influence of particular drugs who've drunk so much water that they've, um, they've suffered water poisoning. So we need to, of course, keep uh, middle ground. And most of the recommendations are around, let's say, um, around one and a half, two liters. So how, mu how much would that be in? Um, Usually around eight glasses is, oh. is a, a really simple reminder, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, but again, I mean, I've, I've worked with people um, who did not drink water at all and who got all of their uh, fluids through their foods. So for mm -hmm. instance, if you drink, uh, if you eat a lot of soup or you eat um, a muesli with uh, with milk or with soy milk or something like that you get a lot of fluids uh, as well so mm -hmm. it's good to manage your own levels of hydration based on your own needs and one of the ways to manage that one of the most effective ways is actually to uh, look at the color of your urine so to see whether it's a, a light yellow color which is typically uh, a sign of good hydration Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think for, the, for anyone who struggles to drink enough water, one of the tricks that I've found, uh, which, so, which might help maybe one other person, so I'll just share it, <laughs> um, is to actually make drinking water fun. 
So I had a doctor who actually, when I told him um, that I struggled to drink enough water, he gave me this idea, you know what, you're the kind of person who probably needs fun and cute glasses and containers and, uh, you know, cups and stuff. So which was really funny, because I do think that if the container is more interesting, I seem to be more attracted to pouring water and like getting myself a glass of water or a bottle of water, which is really strange, but perhaps that's our connected to our personality type. So we can think about how personality plays um, as integral practitioners, we can take into consideration how personality plays a role in the body module per period. Enneagram fours and fives are typically the ones who are the furthest away from the gut module, the, the eight, nine, and ones. And you will see typically they struggle to connect with their bodies and sometimes to treat their bodies with love and respect. So also with drinking water, um, the other thing that has made it easy for me is to infuse it with fruit. So uh, on like, sometimes I'll get a big pitcher of water and lots of ice cubes and I'll just put some slices of fruit in it um, one day or maybe some uh, mint and make it a little more interesting so that you're not having to deal with all the calories of drinking juice or something or kind of certainly not flavored drinks but you can make your water a lot more interesting just by adding a few um, slices of strawberries and mint maybe one day and another day it could be a few slices of a couple of um, oranges or kiwi fruit is really nice in your water so I think we there are lots of ways to make your water fun <laughs> well said and a really important point that with all of these themes we're basically looking for how to make them as motivating for you as possible indeed because it's the same with exercise if you have an exercise routine that that you don't really enjoy then chances are, are good that it's going to be very difficult to sustain so um finding pattern of movement finding exercises that suit you the best is, is very important or indeed finding a, a correct uh, or, or a, an appetizing glass so you can drink water and finding out foods that you like which are healthy so it's indeed and your your suggestion to explore the world kitchen basically is, is also a way in which you can find which um, dishes are, very, are healthy and which suit you the best and so you can sustain a healthy nutrition in the practice also yeah Right. Nice. And for exercise, what is motivating to me sometimes is a really great playlist. If I have a really cool, uh, like lots of awesome dance music, I actually really enjoy running. Um, so, yeah. Nice. How about rest and relaxation? Yes. Well, I'm, one of the ways I find it very um elucidating to introduce rest and relaxation is if you think of the heart muscle then since we were born it's been it's been contracting and relaxing and if it only contracts then you're dead and if it only relaxes then you're dead so the it's one of the themes of of the human experience and of of the universe in general is that there's expansion and contraction or exertion and, and rest just like with the other practices so a good nutrition um, approach a good uh, hydration approach a good approach to sleep it's also very important to have a good approach to relaxation a number of ways you can do this is um, to do exercises for instance where you're lying on your back so all of the muscles of your body also the postural muscles are all relaxed and there are a large number of exercises, audio exercises that you can listen to where you basically do a body scan, which is a very well-known type of exercise where you basically travel through your body with your attention. And it's called uh, in, in the yoga tradition, there's a beautiful practice called yoga nidra. If, if anybody wants to check that out, it's a beautiful practice of lying down and going through this very unique body scan um there are lots of youtube videos for yoga nidra as well excellent well indeed and and that's um that's also important for physical relaxation because many people will say i feel relaxed when i'm gardening or i feel relaxed when i'm uh um doing something else for instance playing a computer game which is 
typically mental relaxation where you where you're not um, focused on something uh, that causes you a lot of stress or strain but here we're speaking about physical relaxation and to do that you need the all of the muscles all of the skeletal muscles so the muscles that move your skeleton basically to be relaxed so basically the uh, lying on your back with with arms and legs relaxed and head supported and relaxed is uh, is one of the best ways to do that yeah yeah i guess if you paid attention to getting the right amount of sleep also you get you're getting some good rest and relaxation there true yeah true yeah really cool uh there was a doctor who actually told me these five pillars they're like the foundation of a home if you were inviting a um, engineer because you want to do some renovations in your home um, and you want to do some remodeling in your house, an architect or a designer or an engineer would come in and they will walk with you and they'll ask you questions. And at certain times, if I want this wall to be broken down and uh, opened up or whatever, they will say, we can do some of it. And there are some um some parts of the house that we're not going to mess with. Those are the weight bearing columns of your of the building. You no matter what new remodeling ideas you might have, there's only so much you can do as long as you know, as long as we're not messing with any of the weight bearing columns. And I remember how this doctor referred to the five pillars of health as non-negotiable, non-negotiable the critical weight-bearing pillars of our lives. It's a good metaphor for me to remind myself as these are weight-bearing columns and I should not be messing around with nutrition, hydration, exercise, rest and relaxation, and uh, what did I miss? Sleep. Sleep, yeah, exactly. And indeed, just, I think it's a very beautiful metaphor and to start with sleep, if people suffer a lack of sleep, over a period of time, you can just see their performance in every aspect of their lives being affected. But it's the same with the other ones. If you don't exercise for a long period of time, then you also suffer significantly. And uh, you and I have spoken before about uh, Sri um, uh, Ramana, Rah uh, uh, Ramana Maharishi. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and how he sat for how many years in a cave? I don't know. Many years. <laughs> Many years, up to the point that he could no longer walk unsupported. So, um... I think we, uh, just speaking from an integral perspective, I think what you're pointing at um, is the lines of development. So we want to have a balanced approach in, in integral. And so if you are highly developed spiritually, but your body line is underdeveloped or falling apart, I think an integral life practice would encourage you to bring balance to both of those lines or all of those developmental lines. So I think with Ramana Maharishi, he had a very, very high level of development spiritually, but I think a lot of us have read about how physically he was falling apart. Um, so if you're a vehicle, it's around bringing balance to all parts of our lives. So balancing all four quadrants um, and all lines of development. I think we can see how personality types play a role in how we approach our health and well-being in a certain way. And I think the, the other thing that I would like to also say, which is really the, the gift of integral life practice or an insight that integral life practice has also offered is that this is our physical body, but that we have three bodies is what we learn from integral life practice. In other words, we have a physical growth body that is really resonant with and, and is lit up and is alive in during the waking state of our lives. But that on the upper right, that we also have a subtle body and that we also have a causal body. So in the upper left, We've spoken about, for example, in our states video, different states of consciousness that we can, subjective states of mind that we can inhabit. And there are corresponding, correlating upper right bodies as well. 
And so the physical body, like I said, is the is the gross body, this body that we can all kind of see objectively. Um, and the subtle body is the body that is aligned with not the waking state, but the dream state. The, the dream, I don't want to call it the dream body, but the dream state is the body of energies and um, various disciplines may refer to them as the body of chi energy, for example, or prana, our sort of life force, um, the chakras, and in acupuncture, the meridians that acupuncturists um, know how to treat. And then, of course, the, the, both the subtle body and the causal body are not bodies that are necessarily recognized by Western uh, physiology or Western science. And then the causal body is the body that is correlating or correspondent to the deep dreamless state, which is the subjective state in the upper left. And the causal body is the body of sort of infinite stillness. And that's how it's um, described in the Integral Life Practice book. Also, it's the body that is um, touched or we can connect through meditation, for example. So in integral life practice, I love what, I don't know if it's Ken or my friend, Mark Binet, who was very much a part of our integral um, institute back in the day, but we had a friend called Mark Binet who was a um, tango dancer. And once we become familiar with the three bodies, he would say it, it takes three to tango. So as integral practitioners, we kind of want to try and pay attention to all three of these bodies. And if you were to ever get this book, Integral Life Practice, you'll be able to see some practices and certain ways in which it's encouraged to maintain an integral life practice in the three bodies. So for example, as you begin your exercise routine, to do a simple witnessing meditation perhaps and you connect with and you exercise the causal body and then after that you can maybe move into a little bit of stretching some yoga stretches maybe or some tai chi uh, which or qigong for example which really connects with the subtle body and then it wakes up the gross body where you can um, do aerobics or running or dancing um, more kind of really exercising the physical domain, the, the waking state gross body. So it's referred to as a three body workout. So an integral life practice is really sort of trying to do all of it to connect the subjective states with the objective bodies, even though two of these objective bodies are not necessarily visible per se. But that's what sort of ancient traditions like, uh, you know, sort of the, the Tai Chi, um, yoga, I think those disciplines were really aware of our uh, energy bodies. Um, I'd also maybe like to just mention focused intensity training, which is something that Integral Life Practice has often talked about. And it's also in this book. So just to give a really quick little definition of what's um, a focused intensity practice. It, it's referred to as a goal star practice and focused intensity training is a state of the art approach to strength training that makes conscious coordinated use of the gross, subtle and causal bodies. It's just like I said, there are some pre-training exercises that are more about the causal body and then um, some core techniques that really connect with the uh, subtle body. And then you sort of end with the gross body. And so you can find out a lot more about these things on this book, Knuckle Life Practice. So um, so that's, that's the importance of why we wanted to just bring up physical body module. So we hope that that, you know, all of us, if we are integral practitioners, that we pay attention to the body module just as much as we may be paying attention to some of the other areas of our lives. So thank you very much, Lee. You too, Namali. And thanks everyone for watching.